Okay, this is uh, 80,000 uh, plain text passwords. Uh, this is an open source love story in three acts, as you were promised in your programs. Um, like every good uh, three act play, we will start with a dramatis personae, a listing of our characters in our play. So first, this is Peppercorn. Peppercorn is one of your user's dogs. And like a good dog owner, the instant Peppercorn's owner got Peppercorn, they changed all of their passwords on all of their services to Peppercorn. This is Mallory. Mallory is an attacker. Mallory is going to attempt to compromise all of your users' passwords. We'll come back to her in a minute. And this is me. Uh, my name is TJ Shook. I am on the internet everywhere as TJ Shook, my name without the dots and spaces, GitHub, Twitter, etc. cetera. Uh, I'm a developer at Harvest. We make the world's best time tracking software. If you do any consulting or freelance work, or if you work for an agency, or if you just get paid money for your time you to yourself to check out Harvest. Um, I am from New York, and it uh, took me a very long time to get here. Um, there we go. Hey. <laughs> uh, New York is 12 hours time shifted from here, so it is literally halfway around the world. Uh, it took me more than 24 hours to get here. I left on Monday and arrived here on Wednesday, so Tuesday just disappeared to the skies. Um, so if I start speaking in tongues or anything, it's because like the part of my brain responsible for speech and language got like mixed up while I was time traveling. Um, most notably for this talk, I am not a security expert. There are real life security experts that get paid lots of money to know a lot of stuff about many things I don't know about. If you have true security problems, you should hire one of them. Uh, but what is important is that I have to be a security expert strictly by virtue of the fact that I have users. Um, if there was a breach or a leak or anything, ignorance is not an excuse. You can't say, we just didn't know any better. That won't absolve you from your sin. So I have users, so I must be a security expert. You probably do as well. So this is an attempt to uh, get rid of some of that you know, excuse of ignorance. So back to Mallory. Let's talk about her attack. Um, Good security is about layers. You should have application level security to protect against SQL injection, XSS, CSRF, all that fun stuff. You should also have infrastructure level security. You should use a secure data center that people just can't walk into. You should have physical firewalls between your devices. However, to truly analyze any individual layer of the security, you should assume that all the other ones have failed. So we have to assume that this works. Mallory can just run her script and get a database dump of your user's table. So with that in mind, let's uh, kind of analyze how we could keep track of your user's passwords to let them authenticate. The easiest option is just plain text. Just store your plain text passwords of your users. This is obviously bad, and no one here is doing this, right? Right? No one raised their hand, but someone here is doing it. They don't want to admit it, but they do it because they have reasons. You know, they, just, they run a site that's for ranking animated GIFs. It doesn't matter if there's a leak. People will just be able to rank GIFs on your user's behalf, whatever. But that, that's not true because users reuse passwords. We learned this about Peppercorn's owner. So when your database gets breached and they find out that your user's password is Peppercorn, they immediately go from your GIF ranking site to banking websites and Gmail and Facebook and try that same password. And because users use the same passwords everywhere, that will work and they will get in further and it will have a deeper leak into their online identity. So we know this is bad. So we need some way to obfuscate the data in this dump. So the obvious first thing is we'll just encrypt it. Um, this is a very secure encryption uh, cipher known as Rote 13, ROT 13, a Caesar cipher with a key 13. You take all the characters and you move them by 13. So A becomes N, B becomes O, C becomes P. It's uh, nearly uh, uncrackable unless you have the key. Um, this, for example, could be something more uh, complex like uh, DES3 or AES256, but the key to all of them is that they are reversible if you have the key. So for this, the key is 13. If you know that, you can decrypt it. For the other ones, if you have the key, you can decrypt it. This is bad though because our system is already compromised. We also have to assume that if she was able to get a database dump, she also has access to our application code where our secret might be or just the physical servers where the keys might be. Um, it's also important to realize that an attacker could be a malicious employee. They have access to a lot of your things that, you know, if they wanted to use them wrongly, they could. So the key here is that encryption is reversible. 
The data is obfuscated, but anyone with that secret can decrypt it. Hashing is irreversible, and that's kind of uh, where we need to go to avoid being able to just take that dump and reverse everything out to get plain text passwords. So if you have a hashing function and you pass something into it, like peppercorn, you get something out. Um, and then if you take something else, like secret one, two, three, four, and hash it, you get something else out. This hash is the output. But if you have a hash, there's no inverse function that you can apply to it to get the input. So that's how we kind of you know, go one way there. Uh, another benefit of hashing is that it's deterministic. So if you hash peppercorn, you get an output. If you hash peppercorn again, you get the same output. If you hash it a third time, you get the same output. So what's important about that is that allows us to check the password when it comes in, matches what we have stored. Um, but also, it's deterministic but not obvious. So if you hash peppercorn twice, you get the same thing. But if you change the input trivially, like uppercasing peppercorn, you get a completely different output. And if you have a trivially different output, so the least significant bit here is off by one, um, the input can be wildly different from the, uh, the input we know. So there's no good way to kind of use these hashes to calculate similar things. So great, all of our problems are solved. We can just hash all of our uh, passwords, and now when we get the plain text password in, we do the same hashing algorithm. If they match, they're authenticated. It's great. We can't go backwards, so everything's safe. Uh, notably, throughout all of this, I'm using MD5 just because its output is shortest, so it fits on a slide well. Everything about SHA-1 or any other kind of basic hashing algorithm is the same. Uh, so, but we have a problem, and that's that hashing is deterministic. We just went over this. But it's a double-edged sword. The hash of peppercorn is always the same, but the hash of peppercorn is always the same. And that leads to the notion of rainbow tables. Um, and before you ask, uh, yeah, this is the best slide that's ever been made. It'll save us a lot of time in Q&A. Um, and more notably, no one calls them this. You will usually see them referred to as lookup tables or something more not jokey. Um, it's usually just used in joke form like I just did. Um, but because every hash is always the same, you know that peppercorn in always comes out in a thing, you can pre-compute tables. So if you just have a long list of possible passwords, you can hash them once and then use a lookup table to get your input. So if we have our dump, we have this hash, and we can put it into a lookup table and see what the value is. And as a proof of concept, we will use the world's best lookup table, which is Google. If you just take a hash and drop it in to Google, um, you don't even have to leave the results page. Um, you can see right on there that that MD5 string is just peppercorn. So, so we need some way to make that not possible for an attacker who has gotten this dump. We need to make these pre-computed tables obsolete. And the easiest way is to just change all of the inputs. So we know that peppercorn is always the same and all these tables exist with peppercorn in it that has that output. So we can append a string of nonsense to it and we effectively just gave this user a strong password and we can keep that like nonsense you know, in our app code or something and we know that that's like kind of our secret and then we get these strong passwords out of it. Um, and then we just add that string to our auth checking and it all works. And you can see we check our lookup table and nothing has that hash. That's never been pre-computed in a lookup table. Great, we did it. We solved password security, guys. Way to go. It only took like eight minutes. That was really easy. Um, and that's true. An attacker will not be able to look up that password in a lookup table, or the hash, rather. Um, the problem is they can't look it up in an existing table, but they can generate a new table trivially because uh, hashing schemes are fast. Uh, on this uh, MacBook Air that is a just workhorse power machine, I can calculate 13 million SHA-1s in a second. 13 million every second. So as a proof of concept, this is where Harvest was. And all of our passwords, we were sha one them with this global salt on all of them. Um, and we knew this was bad. We had it there for a long time. It was on like our list of things to fix, but you know, we hadn't had a breach yet. But no one has a breach until the first time they had a breach. Uh, so to be preemptive, I went ahead and white hat attacked our database. Um, you can use any freely available program that you can download from the internet. I used Hashcat. You Google Hashcat, you find it. You can use John the Ripper. You can install John the Ripper via Homebrew. It's not hard to do. I got a handful of word lists on the internet by Googling for you know, password dictionaries and put them all together and got 25 million uh, unique entries. And I ran it. And then right there in the middle was Peppercorn, along with 80,000 other passwords from the Harvest database. Uh, and I got them in 87 seconds. 
took a minute and a half to get 80,000 passwords, and it was not that hard. Um, this isn't even a majority of our users, but it's definitely enough to do damage. So, uh, and as a note, I did my best to keep all the data anonymized, so if you are a Harvest user, I don't know your password. I tried to just work solely on the hashes and not keep them associated. Um, in this dump, there's also things like these passwords. And that first one, you know, that's kind of the common like leet speak way to get a better password. But all of these word lists are very smart, and all of these programs are very smart, and they will automatically check all of these alternates. So that universe there was cracked. That second one seems like a very secure password as well, until you look at a QWERTY keyboard and realize that's like a hardware hack, and it just follows keys on a QWERTY layout. And again, these word lists are smarter than that, and they're all in there. That third one, I don't know why it's in there. That seems good. I haven't figured out that that's like, you know, a character from Game of Thrones or anything. That's just a thing. Um, but again, like, these things are good. They, they have many different options there. It's probably just surely based on its length. It just calculated it. So that brings us to the concept of true salting. In Harvest, we were doing a global salt, uh, and that's what we were just talking about. But we can do a per password salt. So every single user, instead of appending that nonsense, we can do it on every single one. This gives all of our users strong passwords, and they all have unique passwords if we add enough entropy to the end of it. So I got rid of the email column just for space here. But so now we have the uh, hash that we store along with the salt. Um, having the salt doesn't really help the attacker. Uh, this is a game of kind of computational expense. So just knowing it doesn't help them do it any faster. And we need to know it as well. So it needs to be stored somewhere. Um, and a very random salt, one with enough entropy, keeps people with the same password from having the same hash. So if you had a very short salt, if you know you had thousands of users all with the password password, there's bound to be a couple that end up with the same salt and end up with the same hash again, which makes cracking one good for cracking multiples. And this is pretty good. This is actually getting us most of the way there. Um, but mostly, this is pretty good for 1976. And that's roughly when this was used in uh, Unix's Crypt3 program that was used for the system passwords in Unix. Um, at the time, in 1976, a modern CPU could calculate about four of those hashes every second. So we had enough complexity there to keep them from cracking it. But today we have these. This is an AMD AX7990. Uh, you can buy one for about a thousand bucks. Um, it can calculate 1.5 billion hashes a second. So MacBook Air, 13 million. This 1.5 billion every second. That makes generating these lookup tables of one per user trivial again. So it's now no longer outside the realm of possibility. The problem is that most hashing algorithms like SHA-1 and MD5 are not made for uh, hashing passwords. They're made to be fast. They're designed to be fast because they're used for things like checking file validity on both ends of a network transfer or something like that. So, in 1999, Niels Provost and David Matsieris published a paper about future adaptable password schemes to avoid this very problem. And the thing they came up with was bcrypt. Now, bcrypt, is, it has all the goodies we've already talked about. It's a one-way hash. It's pre-image resistant. It's deterministic. It has built-in per-password salts. We'll see that soon. But it has two specific things that make it better for all the problems we previously talked about. One is that it's based on xblowfish, which is its underlying cipher. Um, it's based on Blowfish, Xblowfish is, which is notably very expensive, but this has changed to be even more expensive. The EKS in Xblowfish stands for Expensive Key Schedule, and it also requires more memory to kind of uh, get Xblowfish up and running, so it makes uh, GPUs and other specialized hardware less feasible again, because they typically don't come with a plethora of RAM. Um, and so that slows down the process of just getting started. But more interestingly, it has this adaptive cost that was in the title of their paper. So let's look back at the dump. So again, this is our dump, and now we have bcrypt uh, digests in our password column. So let's examine the anatomy of a bcrypt digest. First things first, uh, ignore the dollar signs. They are just delimiters of all the fields. They don't signify anything special. This last field is the hash. That's the final checksum that comes out of it. This thing right to the left is the salt. So that's you know, nice. We don't have to worry about generating our own salts or dealing with our own salts or storing them. They're just right in the algorithm, and they're stored right in the digest. So gets rid of a thing we have to worry about. 
uh, this first field is just an identifier. This just means this is a bcrypt digest. Uh, 2x and 2y also signify bcrypt hashes for historical reasons that we can talk about later. Um, other things signify other algorithms, but 2a, 2x, and 2y are bcrypt. But this one, this is the interesting one. This is the cost. So what you do is when you bcrypt a password to get your hash out, you pass it a cost as well. So peppercorn with 10 comes out as a thing. Peppercorn with 10 again comes out as a different thing, but that's because of salting. We already went over that. Uh, peppercorn with a cost of 14 comes out with a thing again. Um, and you can see right there in the digest, there's that cost of 14 that we just passed in it. What is notable about this isn't the output, but how long it takes to get the output. So on this MacBook Air, that first one took about 0.06 seconds, second one took about 0.06 seconds, but the third one took more than one second, 1.04 seconds. And that's what that future adaptable scheme means. Uh, this is a rough average of doing a bunch of bcrypt hashes with each cost on this machine. Uh, you have to balance as a developer uh, how long you want your users to wait, but again, if they're offing into your application, adding a couple of tenths of a second won't necessarily be noticeable, whereas for an attacker, it will be. And it's future adaptable because by increasing this cost over time, we can march ahead with the hardware. So as hardware gets faster, our passwords can get more expensive, and we don't have to worry about it. Before, the attack I did on the Harvest database took 87 seconds to get those 80,000 passwords. Now the exact same attack with the same word list, same program, will take 84,000 years, which is a notable improvement. Um, that is no longer economically feasible for an attacker to carry out. So bcrypt is kind of the sweet spot there. Um, additionally, it has a Ruby library, which is very useful for us. We'll talk about that gem in a second. Some people here now are thinking, well, you should be using pbkdf2, or you should be using script, or whatever. And that's fine. You're ahead of the game. Way to go. You're ahead of the curve. Uh, we can debate the merits of them afterwards. I still think you're wrong. But uh, <laughs> regardless, though, if you are already using pbkdf2 or script, you can stick with it. You don't have to convert to bcrypt. But if you are using something like SHA-1, you should consider it. So how do we fix it? What is the fix? Um, to do the conversion, we need this plain text password. You can't go from one hash to another. So if you already have the plain text password, if you're in that first step, it's easy. You can just do the conversion manually. It might take some time, but you'll get through your database eventually. Otherwise, we can just uh, take our old hashing scheme. So when we authenticated through, we had the plain text password. We hashed it and made sure it matched. Um, we want to get to here, where we take the uh, password coming in and compare it to the bcrypt digest. Um, a couple of you are probably realizing here that that uh, seems to uh, you know, contradict what I said earlier about it being irreversible, where we are taking the password digest, passing into bcrypt, and then uh, comparing it to the plain text password. Uh, that's because the bcrypt Ruby gem overloads the equals equals operator in probably the worst design decision of it. But uh, just be aware that it is not, in fact, reversing it. It's using that to check the hashes against each other. Um, so, but to do that conversion, we can just kind of pre-filter in our uh, authentication flow to convert. So we have it coming in. If it's, uh, you know, we go to this conversion method. If it's already converted, we just bounce back out. Um, if it's not, just update it in place and go onward. Again, as a proof of concept, because we did this with Harvest, uh, this was what happened with us. We did that exact same code, was out of the Harvest code base for the conversion. Um, over the course of two and a half weeks, we kind of had this curve of natural conversion. So there's a big spike up front uh, as all the daily users and people using like the Mac app and the iPhone app auth in. And then slowly as weekly users and bi-weekly users and less often users logged in, we got more and more of them. Um, but this didn't quite get us all the way. Uh, but since I had already white hack, uh, attacked the uh, database, I could just do it a second time with conversion in mind. And that got us a giant spike that got us the rest of the way there. Um, we had a few remaining active users that weren't done. For them, we just manually reset their password and sent them an email and let them know it was up. But it wasn't that many, and it, was, uh, it wasn't as hard as it seems like it would be. There is one downside of bcrypt, and that's what we've already talked about. It is an expensive algorithm, and an expensive algorithm is expensive. So you can guess when we launch bcrypt here. This is our utilization of our CPU on our servers, and it about doubled. Um, part of this is because Harvest API still supports basic authentication, and it's used a lot. So every uh, request that comes in has a password along with it, so another bcrypt gets uh, computed. But if you're already whole hog on OAuth 2, that won't be as much of a problem. But more so, this is still well within the realm of acceptability, so it's totally worth it. So in our three-act play, act one is exposition. That's the boring spark. Now you're all good. 
Act two is where we add the conflict. So, uh, Bcrypt has a Ruby gem that I mentioned earlier called uh, Bcrypt Ruby. Um, this is great for us as Ruby developers because it makes it easy to use it. And as part of this, I had a feature that I wanted to add to Bcrypt Ruby that I thought would be useful. Uh, so I went to go uh, submit a pull request and the test didn't run and there were dependencies that were out of date and there were missing docs. So uh, that one pull request turned into a dozen pull requests. And then if you just do that long enough and pester enough, uh, Amon will get tired of you and just ask for commit bit and then you will get it. And then you become, uh, Amon was the de facto maintainer of Bcrypt Ruby and now it's me. Um, so, yeah. Notably, this is what Bcrypt Ruby's source looks like. But more accurately, this is what Bcrypt Ruby's source looks like. It is a Ruby gem wrapper around a C and a Java implementation of Bcrypt. Uh, you want it to run as fast as possible because your attackers will be running it as fast as possible. So you want to, you know, use a C implementation to match what your attacker will be using. Uh, Along with this though, when you release a version of the gem, you have to release native binaries so that your users aren't dependent on having a compiler on their machine. It's just a nice courtesy you can provide. So every version of Bcrypt Ruby has four versions that get distributed. And the top two there are Windows binaries. Um, I am not a Windows developer, so I didn't know really how to do that. Uh, but there are these fat binaries that provide uh, support for multiple versions of Ruby wrapped up into one binary. Uh, luckily, when Amon added the uh, code to do all of this, he left this nice, long, detailed uh, commit message about doing it. But he left it two years ago, and like all things about computers on the internet that are two years old, it doesn't work. About five years ago, Aaron, I think, introduced the concept of fat binary gems. Uh, this is where I found out that he made the same queen joke as me five years before me. But more so, anything about computers written on the internet that's five years old definitely doesn't work. All of this stuff is ultimately, though, just wrapping up Rake Compiler, which is this great gem that does what it says on the tins, provides a standard and simplified way to build and package Ruby extensions C and Java using Rake as glue. Great. So it has nice long documentation. And I walked through and installed everything, and it didn't work. So, the Rails team has a project called the Rails Dev Box. And what this has in the Dev Box is all, or all of the external dependencies that you are not necessarily wanting to have on your machine, but this allows you to develop on your machine but run tests in this Dev Box that has all of the external dependencies preloaded in it. So I had a dream that I was going to make a rate compiler dev box that had all the dependencies we need, all the rubies, uh, a GCC, the JDK, MingW, which is the uh, thing that allows Nix-like machines to compile Windows binaries. And uh, Vagrant made this possible because it's exactly what it says, create and configure lightweight, reproducible, and portable development environments, exactly what I wanted. So I did that, I made a Vagrant box, it was awesome, and it didn't work. <laughs> so, what do you do with anything that doesn't work? You put it on GitHub. Um, <laughs> and with that, I opened up rate compiler number 79. In our three-act play, this would be the climax. This is the turning point. And you were promised a love story. This is Luis Lavena. Uh, Luis is the developer of the one-click Ruby installer for Windows. If you do any Ruby development on a Windows machine, you owe him a debt of gratitude. Because of that work, he is also a member of the Ruby core team. And because of both of those, he was voted a Ruby hero in 2010. But most notably for me, as not a Windows developer and not in 2010, uh, he is the developer of Rake Compiler. So when I opened that issue saying, listen man, I did everything I could, I followed all the docs, nothing works. Uh, Luis came back and opened up Rake Compiler dev box number two. And Rake Compiler dev box number two, you should check out because this is an epic thread where Luis drops on me triple hearts, not one time, <laughs> not two times, not three times, but four whole times. 12 hearts, I know. But here's the problem. Now I'm 12 hearts in the hole, so I need all you guys to take out your internet devices and tweet at Luis three hearts, because I have a debt to repay. So uh, have at it. You can use fancy emoji if you'd prefer. Um, 
and just generally thank him for being a wonderful OSS maintainer and contributor. Uh, now, some of you think you have figured out my scam, that I'm just traveling around the world to A, repay an emoji debt, but B, to kind of, you know, love troll Luis. But uh, to half of you, I just want to encourage you to find your own Luis. Uh, find someone, thank them for their work, but that's easy and boring, but uh, collaborate with them. Find something and work with them. It's surprisingly rewarding. And, you know, Luis is, uh, he lives in Paris and Argentina, so it's uh, a fun global col collaboration there. Uh, it could be any OSS maintainer whose work you admire or you want to use. It could be a coworker, whatever. It's easy. But to the other half of you, the ones who are already maintaining a giant library or already fielding dozens of pull requests, I want to bastardize a quote and encourage you to be the Luis that you wish to see in the world. So when someone comes to you with you know, that same issue over and over again, and you're tempted to just throw your hands up and yell RTFM, consider for a moment that the problem might be the FM, not the library or the person, and do your best to kind of walk them through it. It will make our community uh, much better and friendly and triple-hearted for all of us. So what have we learned today? Three big lessons. One, use bcrypt. Just do it. It's not that hard. If you have any questions about it, if you want to walk through, find me afterwards. We'll hug, we'll cry, we'll convert our passwords. Number two is distribute a dev box. If you have any project that has complicated external dependencies, do everyone else a favor and make a dev box that can let them do it. Alternatively, if you ship a gem that has native extensions, try out recompiler dev box. It will make you not rip your hair out anymore compiling native binaries. But most importantly, I encourage you to release to collaborate and to iterate. And thank you. Thanks, TJ, for the, for the awesome talk on security and uh, the little spiel on open source. Um, any questions for him? Again, the mics are, yeah. yeah. You gotta come to the mic. Can I have a shout? No, because then it won't be on the video. Hi, everyone at home. Hello. Hi there. What does has secure password do in Rails? Thank you. <laughs> uh, so he asked what has secure password does in Rails. That was a little fast uh, in Australian to understand. Um, <laughs> I believe has support password is in active support. Um, it effectively just kind of wraps this up for you. So you can drop into your model has secure password and it will provide you an authenticate method and a couple of validations around passwords and password confirmations. Um, if you look at the source for it, it's not long. It's, you know, a dozen line, maybe two methods. It, you can, yeah, you can implement it yourself or use it. Um, I usually don't use it because uh, the validations are a little bit uh, not in line with what I want to do, but yeah, it, it uses bcrypt, Rails uses bcrypt. Great. Hey, Aaron. Hi. Um, so while you were hacking your application, like you were attacking yes. the application, would you say that you were harvesting passwords? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Aaron Patterson. Yeah, yes, indeed, I was. <laughs> All right, if you do have something and you're just too shy, find me afterwards. It'll be great. Thank you.